Okay, so we're ready to kick things off. Uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. Uh, and welcome to the Sufan Center's webinar event. We're happy to host a conversation today with you all, distinguished experts, to discuss white supremacy trends, particularly a deep look at the Adam Waffen division, including the anatomy of the group, its violent acts, its transnational linkages, and cover why this group should or should not be sanctioned as a terrorist organization in the United States or potentially elsewhere. My name is Amarita Torres, and I am the Director of Policy Research and Programs at the Sufan Center. The Sufan Center is a nonpartisan strategy center based in New York, dedicated to increasing awareness of global security issues, both in the United States and around the world. Since 2017, the Sufan Center has documented the existence of a global network of white supremacist extremists that stretches from North America to Europe to Australia and beyond. White supremacists today are organizing in a very similar fashion to jihadist terrorist organizations like Al Qaeda did in the 1980s and 1990s. We have researched and analyzed the Adam Waffen Division extensively, or as it's called, AWD. It's a US-based group which has been linked to a range of violent attacks in the United States that many experts have underscored meet the definition of terrorist acts. Besides its violent acts uh, that they've committed, AWD boasts transnational linkages as well. Its members maintain links to Canada, Germany, the United Kingdom, Ukraine, Estonia, and elsewhere. The group has also cultivated linkages to other white supremacy extremist groups abroad, including the Ferenkrieg Division, a German chapter labeled AWD Deutschland, and the Antopedian Resistance based in Australia. But 2020 has proved to be a difficult year for the Adam Waffen Division. This past February, law enforcement arrested several alleged members of the group, including two of its leaders. In early March, there was chatter and a piece by Politico that the State Department was on the brink of designating the first violent white supremacist group, and Adam Waffen was considered to be its top candidate. We now know that that didn't happen, um, and another group was, was designated instead. Soon after, in March, the Adam Waffen division announced that it had actually disbanded. All of this recent activity has borne many changes for Adam Waffen and raises many questions. Some observers consider Adam Waffen's disbanding as disingenuous, a reaction to infiltration, arrests, and the threat of sanctions, and less an ideological change of heart. This propaganda and messages still circulate online, and perhaps some members are now simply laying low. Others note that robust intelligence, law enforcement, and the impending threat of sanctions, coupled with pressure from lawmakers, activists, and journalists, all came together to exert enough pressure on the group to bring about its demise. To some observers, Adam Waffen is frankly no more. But today we're gonna to address all of this activity as we weigh the need for sanctions in light of these recent developments. And Adam Waffen must be understood as part of a broader global challenge that we face. We released the Sufan Center, a paper in September of 2019 that laid out this analysis with several policy recommendations, including that the US government consider sanctioning white supremacy extremist groups as the terrorist groups that they are, much like we have sanctioned ISIS, Al Qaeda, and its affiliates. We've seen Canada, the United Kingdom, and most recently the United States take some steps in this direction. But white supremacy extremist groups nonetheless, including in the US, have kept the pace, recruiting new members, spreading propaganda, and taking advantage of the COVID-19 crisis to pursue their aims of propelling a race war and creating societal divisions. As the threat evolves, so too does the response of governments, international institutions, and civil society organizations. And sanctions is a major tool that has been proven to be successful in the past, both from a practical perspective and symbolically. So the goal of the conversation today is to discuss the Adam Waffen's past actions and assess its future aspirations with a view to considering whether the US and perhaps other nations should consider sanctioning this group. One note uh, I wanna mention on terminology. As a center, we have used the, the broad umbrella term white supremacy extremism to cover the different threads and factions within the broader group, and the, excuse me, within the broader movement. One of the challenges in combating this movement is that white supremacy extremism is far from monolithic and is especially diverse in Europe, where the movement is characterized by a range of entities and often seeks shelter in a broad tent of fringe politics and underground movements. So please keep this in mind. We're gonna use terms like far-right extremism, extreme right, violent white supremacy. So turning now to our speakers, we have a really impressive group 
with us today who are gonna walk us through these issues. I'm gonna introduce them briefly to you all. Jason Blazakis is a senior research fellow at the Sufan Center. He directs the Center on Terrorism, Extremism, and Counterterrorism at the Middlebury Institute, where he's also a professor. He was previously with the US federal government for nearly 20 years, with 10 of those years spent uh, in the Counterterrorism Bureau. Next, we have Tess Owen. She's a journalist with Vice News. Tess has been with Vice for about five years, and over the last two of those years, she's been focused on the developments of the far right. She's attended numerous rallies, and she's witnessed firsthand how the movement has evolved, growing more sophisticated, more terroristic, and more international in a very short time frame. Tess has written about social media platforms in the far right, terrorism law, propaganda, extremist recruitment tools of current and former military members, and guns. Next, we have Nikita Malik. She's an associate fellow at the Sufan Center and the director of the Center on Radicalization and Terrorism at the Henry Jackson Society in London. Nikita is an internationally recognized expert on countering violent extremism, as well as terrorism, hate-based violence, and she focuses on youth de-radicalization. In her role, she has worked with key policymakers in government departments in the UK and globally. So before we get started, just a few housekeeping issues. First, um, this conversation is on the record, so please keep that in mind. Secondly, the Q&A function. So you'll see in your Zoom console, there's a Q&A function. We're gonna use that to take your live questions. So please send those over, use that uh, function for questions uh, that we'll take after the moderated discussion. So with that, I'm gonna pose my first question and I'm gonna pose it to Jason. Um, so Jason, We've seen a rise in white supremacy related attacks, both domestically and internationally, over the last few years from Christchurch, El Paso, and most recently, uh, the attacks in Germany in February. Um, we know that the white supremacy extremist movement is alive and well in the US to include the, acts, the, the activities of the Adam Waffen division. So can you walk us through a little bit about how Adam Waffen came to be and its narrative? Thanks, Amarita. It's great to, to be on the panel today with uh, the, the full team. Uh, the Autumn Waffen Division, um, first I'll just say, I'm gonna just, just go through some of the you know, original formation of the organization, the structure of the organization, the ideology of the organization, some of the major influencers who um, you know, push the, the group towards the ideology it, it has. So first, I think it's important to say that the, the group's founding happened a little bit more than five years ago. So it's still a fairly new entity. Um, and it was formed over a, a now defunct website known as um, Iron March, which is a, a fascist website where individuals with fascist leanings would go and communicate with one another. And that's where the group announced its formation to the, the world. One of the, the first leaders of that group, and I say leaders because it's really hard to assess who is truly the, the top leader within this entity, was a guy by the name of Brandon Clint Russell, and I'll come back to him in a moment after I go through some of these other points I want to make in terms of the structure, for instance. Um, structurally speaking, the Autumn Waffen Division is, is a cellular-based organization. Um, it's been estimated to have anywhere between um, a several dozen individuals to 80 members, possibly more located in the United States. And as Emerita, you mentioned, they have um, foreign connected networks as well in places like Germany, Ukraine, et cetera. Um, so it, the organization doesn't function kind of like the prototypical terrorist group as we think about like groups like ISIS where you have, you know, the, the, the caliph, um, people like Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi and then a chain of command underneath of him. Um, in, instead, the organization, I, I would argue, operates more in the the sense of a leaderless resistance-like movement, um, and taking from sort of the, the writings um, in the model um, put forward by a very infamous uh, white supremacist by the name of Lewis Beam. He put this model forward in 1983 um, as a, a method to try to essentially obscure organizations from detection through law enforcement. And mm -hmm. to ideology, the group's members adhere to the idea of creating a, a racially pure white state. And the members try to do this within the Otham Waffen division through the collapse of society and the creation essentially of anarchy through violence with the ultimate goal of accelerating the collapse of the state. Um, and that violence that they take um, often targets races um, other than white, obviously, um, federally protected persons, um, LGBTQ um, community, um, leftist organizations, government institutions, and infrastructure, 
all are part of the, the target list of groups like the Otham Waffen division. So it, it sits neatly within this accelerationist set of white supremacist groups. In, in terms of influences, uh, who are the people that influence the group? Um, beyond the Nazis, because it's a neo-Nazi organization and the Nazis of World War II and people like Adolf Hitler, the group has expressed admiration for a slew of infamous characters ranging from Timothy Bay, the perpetrator of the Oklahoma City bombing, to Dylan Ruth, the individual who carried out the, the heinous attack in South Carolina at a church, Anders Breivik, um, well known for the 2011 attack in Norway, um, in, individuals like that, people who have carried out acts of violence that they um, admire. Um, and then, of course, the organization is influenced by individuals um, who are perceived to be the quote unquote, and I, I say quote unquote, thinkers within this milieu, people like um, James Mason, who some people have said is mm -hmm. the, the leaders of the organization. I know we'll talk about him more. Or people like William Pierce, who is the author of the Turner Diaries. So that's a little bit about the influences, ideology, uh, structure, and formation of the organization. I know we'll have probably more opportunities to talk about the group's attacks. Thank you, Jason, for that. I think it's important to have a baseline understanding for everyone on the call. So sort of who is this group? What's its narrative? How does, how does it project? Um, I wanted to follow up, and actually I'll follow up uh, with this question for Tess. And I mentioned it a bit in my intro, but in March this year, it was announced that the Adam Walken Division of actually disbanded, allegedly. Uh, and James Mason, a notorious neo-Nazi and a spiritual influence on the group, um, announced this. So I wanted to ask you, Tess, as someone who's been covering this on the ground, I'd be interested to know, what do you, what do you make of this announcement? Uh, thanks for the question and thanks for having me. Um, so yeah, M Mason announced their, that they were disbanding in this three minute clip in March posted to SoundCloud. Around that time, um, and this was after a string of FBI arrests of Atomorphin members, I'd heard that they had maybe 20 members, and that was pr probably generous. Mm -hmm. um, but also, I mean, the month before Mason put up that clip, there was a, a nine-page document, um, kind of an Atomorphin manual that sort of formalized their, um, their organizational strategy, which, you know, Jason talked about, about you know, leaderless resistance. Um, saying that, you know, they should only operate in small cells or as lone wolves and that this would, you know, make it harder for, to, you know, to be infiltrated by law enforcement. Mm. Um, I'll also say that there is like, Adam Wolf has had a reputation um, from what I have seen sort of in chatter online of being sort of very infiltrated of informants and there's a lot of distrust and suspicion within the ranks. Mm. Um, and so that's also made things um, sort of difficult. And in addition, there's some splinter groups that have formed, one called Fission, um, F-I-S-S-I-O-N, which Mason has denounced, but some of the perhaps former Atomorphin members have defected to that group. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Really helpful. I think we're going to continue on on this theme of, you know, even though a group like an Atomorphin group has disbanded, or allegedly, what does that mean for the recruits in the ranks, what does that mean for the broader white supremacy extremist movement? Um, actually, I wanted to follow up with you, Tess, um, on, on just given your experience, you've been a part of these rallies, um, and Adam Waffen, its growth, it really surged during the Unite the Right rally in, in Charlottesville, uh, and we know you, you've been involved in this. So can you talk to us a little bit, and you mentioned the manual as well, which I find to be quite interesting from Adam Waffen. What can you tell us about how the group organizes, whether it's at rallies or other events? Well, I think after Charlottesville, there was a really important um, um, change in the, like, the broader white supremacy movement, where you had half of the people sort of trying to rebrand and, and gain legitimacy. Um, groups like now Identity, um, American Identity Movement, formerly Identity Europa, trying to go more mainstream. And then you had others like Adam Waffen <clears throat> who became kind of more, um, more closed off, more hardcore, more violent, um, and also more international, I think. Mm -hmm. And in terms of how they've organized, um, I mean, in their manual, they, they do discourage members from attending rallies or basically engaging in any activity that could be described as petty crime Mm. their sort of motto is kind of more or less like go big or go home. So, you know, if you're going to get arrested, make, you know, make it worth something. And mm. there's also been chatter on Telegram, even last night, you know, encouraging, um, you know, hardcore accelerationists, for example, to exploit the unrest in uh, Minneapolis. Or mm. um, <clears throat> my colleagues, Ben McCoochin, um, 
and, uh, and Mac Lemmer, they reported on the base, also an accelerationist group, who were arrested and were allegedly plotting to open fire on a pro-gun rally in, in, in Richmond. <clears throat> so I think they, they, they tried to they seek out opportunism or ways to exploit large events to cause as much violence as possible. Well. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, you know, you, you mentioned go big or go home. Um, and we're seeing, I mean, we're seeing a lot of these white supremacist groups, not just in the United States, but around the world, you know, seeking to, to go big, right? Um, and I wanted to turn now to Nikita for her experience uh, coming from the UK, because she, she, she sits in London. Um, and, and we've talked a little bit about um, how these elements manifest in the United States, Adam Waffen and others. But Nikita, can you walk us through a little bit about how the threat of white supremacy has manifested in the United Kingdom? You're on mute, yeah. <laughs> First, so, uh, so thank you so much as well for having me as a panelist today. Um, so speaking from a, from a national perspective in the United Kingdom, what would be quite useful, I think, is, is to kind of understand the scale of what we deal with here. So what's unique in the UK, um, unlike the United States, is we have a prevent program, and that is an um, essential way for us to actually gain statistics on the levels of far-right extremism or Islamist extremism in the UK. And the prevent program is essentially um, when uh, people in schools, uh, universities, neighborhoods, and communities flag to people that they think someone is at risk of either white supremacy uh, extremism or Islamist extremism. And the third category is actually Sikh extremism in the United Kingdom. So um, if, if I could reference some numbers, uh, I have here that, um, you know, in uh, uh, the, the, the far right um, is following a, a very key um, speech that a senior counterterrorism official made in the UK. Uh, the far right poses the fastest growing threat um, in the United Kingdom. And that's because 25% uh, of arrests, so we aren't even looking at prevent figures, but arrests in 2019 uh, were linked to extreme uh, right-wing violence. And also the caseloads for the police uh, jumped from 6% to 10% uh, in the last 10 years. And since March, 2017, 2017 in the UK for us, of course, was a key year because uh, we saw an, a number of terrorist attacks uh, nationally the um, counterterrorism forces foiled eight extreme right-wing plots. So what we see here um, is, is a threat that is growing. Uh, in the United Kingdom, it's seen as one of the fastest growing uh, extreme right-wing threats. And to kind of go back to the figure on the prevent uh, radicalization program statistics, uh, between 2018 and 2019, there were 1,389 referrals uh, that were made for the uh, far right uh, compared to 1,404 referrals made for Islamist extremism. So they are almost at par. Now, if I could just talk quickly as to what this means in the UK, what we've done about it. So one of the most interesting things we've done in the far right, in my opinion, besides prescribing groups, is uh, which agency has responsibility for the far right. Um, so prior to um, our independent reviewer, for counterterrorism legislation, Max Hill, he, he was a previous uh, independent reviewer, you know, he was talking about um, the threat level in the UK, which is set by uh, JTAC, our um, Joint Terrorism Analysis Center, uh, Joint Threat Analysis Center, and that tended to look at foreign threats and not so much what was happening in the UK. Now, the reason I make this point is, of course, we'll come to this later, the US is still battling with this, but what we saw in the UK was that, um, we began to look at the far right as actually a national threat as well, which then made it easier for us to prescribe groups. And uh, the division of responsibility went from police and looking at this as a hate crime issue to actual um, counterterrorism officers and MI5 and looking at this as a very serious issue. Um, so, so that in very broad strokes is, is what has happened in the UK. And looking at it from a US perspective, it's fascinating because obviously the United States is still dealing with these issues. And here we have a case study of how some of these systems and processes have been put in place to designate um, and prevent a far right violence. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Nikita. And there's so much to unpack there that you've shared. I mean, from the statistics, um, and, I, and I think for the United States as well, we're seeing obviously an increase in far right attacks. Uh, and we're seeing an increase uh, to the point where, you know, our 
the head of the FBI announced, I believe this year, that you know white supremacy extremism or what the terminology that they use is on par with you know jihadist terrorism threat to the homeland to the u.s homeland so that is something that um that we're tracking closely as well and i think you know unpacking that and 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 the work of the prevent program is is critical so thank you and we'll go back to some of uh what you mentioned as well um throughout throughout the discussion i want to turn now a little to the use of the online space and how white supremacy extremist groups are using it. Um, and I think there's much to, to talk about here. Um, Adam Waffen, for example, has made great use of online platforms to spread their hateful messages and their propaganda from Telegram to Discord. So I'd be interested to know, and, and I know you're all covering this and you're all experts on, on their use. So I'll start with Jason and then I'll move to Nikita and then Tess, if you can tell us a little bit about how Adam Waffen and other groups perhaps are using the online space. Thanks, Emory. And I think just to go back to one of my original comments is, of course, it's important to understand they, they had essentially um, got to, to know one another over Iron March, um, you know, now defunct fascist website. So that, that's where the, this kind of this virtual meeting place for the organization. And, and for groups like the Autumn Waffen Division, meeting virtually was really important. And, and they did so any number of ways. Um, and, ProPublica, for instance, has done some really good reporting about how the organization was using Discord, um, essentially an online um, chatting app that's associated with the gaming community. And, and they're now, thankfully, um, open to researchers all those messages. So you can go through, call those messages, and, and see sort of what the organization was talking about over Discord. Uh, they, they've done some communication, like you said, Emerita, um, and eventually transitioned from kind of, you know, open platforms like Iron March. Um, they had a Twitter feed for a little while um, taken down and then moved to more encrypted communications like Telegram. I think Tess can probably e expand upon that um, significantly. She's done some great reporting about how white supremacists have been using Telegram. Um, for the organization, it was a, a method to, to communicate with one another, but it was also a method to recruit um, each other. Um, and to recruit new members into the organization and to inspire people to take um, action. Uh, in October 2019, um, right around the same time, there was a lot of pressure being put on the organization. You, you saw them put forward a new recruitment video. I think they called it Fission, which is interesting when you talk about the, the name change and evolution of the organization, perhaps with these new splinters being created, um, that they use that as a mechanism um, with imagery, um, with people with knives, um, black flags, um, burning US and Israeli flags as a propaganda point as well over Telegram. And so those are some of the, the key things I've seen in the context of um, online activity for the organization. It's also been a, a portal for organizations to essentially pledge fealty to the group. The mm -hmm. Ukrainian-based Autumn Waffen Division um, pledged its allegiance online to the organization also in 2019 to the Autumn Waffen um, US-based um, division. So. The, this is really a, a key area um, and will continue to be um, because law enforcement over the last six months in particular have really done a, a fantastic job in arresting quite a few um, individuals. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thanks for that. Nikita, anything to add? I think you're on mute still. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can't speak for um, Adam Waffen Division myself, and I'm sure Tessa will, will, will pick up on this based on her extensive research, but to speak on the far right more generally, it has been quite interesting examining the online space and seeing some of the parallels between far right movements and Islamist movements. Um, and a lot of that has come from, of course, prescriptions of far right groups, um, including from, from uh, platforms like Facebook that have gone beyond uh, government prescriptions and prescribed groups themselves. So we begin to see some of these open platforms, which were crucial for, as Jason said, building up networks, uh, creating uh, friendship groups, uh, discussing logistics to more what we call alt tech platforms. Um, and and I, I think while I haven't studied alt tech platforms myself, what we have also seen in the online space is the increased use of um, signaling and coded language mm -hmm. to try to um, get this wider audience to switch to these um, all tech platforms. Because what you don't want is, you know, the small group of friends you already have. You want your group to have some kind of traction and bring new recruits in. And unfortunately, I don't think you can do that as well in all tech unless you actually have an open platform that people might use to, to um, kind of guide you there. Um, so, so there are some tactics that have uh, mirrored Islamist techniques, and there have also been some tactics that are unique to the far right. 
Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Nikita. Um, and you, and one thing that I thought of as you were talking um, with the signaling, the signaling in the coded language is gaming as well um, and their use of gaming. So I'll turn to Tess. Uh, Tess, do you have anything to add to that? Um, well, yeah, I, I have, I did track um, sort of the spread of accelerationism, which Jason mentioned is this violent ideology that groups like Adam Waffen ascribe to, which um, basically promotes violence to speed up the collapse of society. Um, and so you saw this spread of these kind of like uh, um, accelerationist channels on Telegram rapidly throughout 2019. And they use kind of public facing channels so that the public facing channels can kind of draw people in. And then there's also private, private channels where they can, you know, once they hook someone, then they can sort of talk and share ideas and share, I mean, bomb making, you know, they're sharing bomb making materials and propaganda across the world. And then in addition to that, um, if, as you say, there, there are gaming platforms like Twitch or Steam um, and some even more obscure platforms, um, which have been very, uh, they've used for recruitment, especially of young men. Mm. Um, and as of Atom Waffen specifically, they were using the, um, the encrypted service wire, um, but they have um, possibly moved to a very obscure gaming forum or whichever members are left, which is something I'm looking into at the moment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, really helpful. I mean, I think especially given how many people are at home now, including young people, um, the ability to attract young white males, um, which tend to be the members of, of these groups, is high, the ability to, to recruit them. So no, that's very helpful. Um, I just wanna remind everyone that uh, the Q&A is open. So please start sending your questions over and we can, and we can start with those shortly. Um, so now I wanna pivot uh, a little bit to, to Tess again, one more time to talk about what you've learned. You've had an interesting uh, opportunity to talk with Adam Waff informers. Uh, and so I wanted to, to, to engage you a little bit on that. What's that been like? What have you learned? from some of, some of the Adam Waff informers you've, you've spoken to? Um, there's a lot of fear, um, fear of retaliation from um, people who are still active in the movement, um, a lot of shame and wanting, you know, wanting to somehow undo the harm that they've caused, but still being, being fearful for their own um, lives. And they've also, I mean, some of them have been able to speak to some of the infighting and suspicion within the movement um, you know, a lot of egos, a lot of different ideas, and a lot of suspicion that so-and-so is an informant, or so-and-so is really a federal agent, or a reporter, or a TIFA. So, um, there's a, yeah, there's a lot of that going on. Really helpful. Um, so, I'm going to transition us now a little bit to, to get to the, the brunt of the conversation, which is the sanctions piece. Um, I want to turn to to Jason now to talk to us a little bit. As a sanctions expert, you've worked on this for many, many years. Uh, what does it take to sanction an organization like an Adam Wappen in the United States? More years than I, I, I like to, to, to say. Um, yeah, it, it, it's really the State Department and Treasury Department, I think it's important to take a step back, um, share authority to sanction terrorist groups pursuant to U.S. law. Uh, the Treasury Department primarily uses Executive Order 13224 to sanction organizations and individuals, and the State Department uses two primary tools to go after groups and individuals. The State Department can designate foreign terrorist organizations pursuant to the Immigration and Nationality Act, and obviously, as the name implies, that's the only sanctioning of organizations. And then it also shares authority and competency with the Treasury Department using Executive Order 13224 to sanction groups and individuals. And in fact, that was the authority the State Department used to sanction the Russian imperial movement on April 6th, the first white supremacist group sanctioned by the United States. Mm -hmm. The sanction of foreign terrorist organizations has three legal criteria. The organization has to be primarily foreign based. So where are the leaders of the organization? Where are its camps? Where are the operations carried out? Second, there has to be some level of engagement in terms of terrorist activity. Um, and that can mean anything from, you know, plotted attacks, um, failed attacks, to um, attacks that were successful using things, say, like improvised explosive devices on the one hand, assassinations on, on the other, mm -hmm. and, and everything in between those two spectrum. And then that terrorist activity um, has to be a threat to U.S. national security interests. And that's very broadly defined in the INA to include foreign policy interests, economic interests, defense interests. How does Adam Waffen fit within sort of the scope of those uh, criteria? 
And, and why has it been so hard, I think, for maybe the State Department or say Treasury Department to take action vis-a-vis -vis sanctions against the organization? First um, challenge, I think, Emerita, um, is the fact that the organization definitely has a presence in the United States. Um, the United States doesn't have a domestic terrorism law, um, and the INA is written in a way that says if there is an organization that has a significant domestic presence, um, you may not be able to essentially pursue the designation because it may not be primarily foreign based, right? So, um, and if you look at some of the attacks um, Autumn Waffen members have carried out, um, the Blaine Bernstein murder in California, um, uh, an Autumn Waffen attack, the plot attack um, by Jarrett Smith in Kansas, um, you know, a member of the United States Army, um, thankfully FBI, um, I think was using confidential informant to scoop him up and take him off the, the board, but he was plotting attacks um, in the United States. Um, you have uh, Russell, um, he was arrested with explosives in his garage, um, also based in the United States. And of course, sort of the ideological founder of the group, um, James Mason lives in Colorado. So these things really cloud the picture um, for the State Department in terms of using that tool um, against Autumn Waffen Division, unless they're able to draw some kind of link saying that there is a larger transnational movement. And, and that might be tricky, but could be done. But that really is predicated on the State Department having really good intelligence on the white supremacist movement. And from my perspective, um, from where I sit, I don't think the U.S. intelligence community that's based overseas, that has the responsibility for overseas collection, whether it's the National Security Agency or the Central Intelligence Agency, are, are very likely investing any level of resources against white supremacists. And if they're not in investing the, the resources on, on the foreign-based um, white supremacist transnational network, then the State Department's depending on essentially open source and unclassified information to put together these dossiers or information that may be shared with them through foreign government sources or foreign government information. And I think that makes it really hard for them to document um, the activity of, of white supremacist organizations writ large to include the Autumn Waffen Division. So those are some of the things going on. And the last thing I would say on this point is there needs to be a, a, a policy um, leadership level decision at a very high level to say that this is a priority. And over the last year, you, you've seen incremental progress by politicians saying that this is a prior priority. But I think that needs to be reflected in the National Intelligence Priorities Framework, the NIPIF as it's called, which essentially guides action overseas. And until that decision is made by somebody at a pretty high level to try to essentially generate more lead information that could be used for sanctions, I think it's going to be really difficult to use this tool in the United States unless there are some um, revisions of law. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Really helpful, Jason. Thank you for laying out that picture, including sort of the three things that, that we should be looking at or that governments in the U.S., the U.S. government should be looking at in terms of sanctioning um, the policy priorities piece. There's a lot to unpack there, the, the domestic terrorism piece of this that we're going to go through. So, so thanks for that. Um, I'm sure it will lead to many questions in the Q&A. So um, I'm going to pivot now to Nikita, because we know that in the U.K., um, they, they have sanctioned the government uh, right-wing groups, including uh, what, what, I, what we believe to be deemed an Adam Waffen offshoot. So I'd be interested to know, now pivoting to the UK experience, what does it take to, to sanction or to prescribe one of these groups? Yeah, so um, building on uh, some research I did early, earlier this year, actually, I was looking, um, so, so the Henry Jackson Society, where I work, um, what we do very well is we look at court cases of offenders. Um, people who have been arrested uh, for terrorism. Uh, for the last, um, you know, since 1998, we've been looking at Islamist terrorists, but um, since I joined the think tank in 2017, we began to look at the far right as well. Um, so we were collecting, um, well, I collected over the last um, year or so, this um, database of 107 offenders who we could track. Um, and we also looked at sentencing. Now, it was, became quickly apparent that Islamist offenders were receiving much stronger sentences than their far-right counterparts. Now, that can be down to a variety of reasons. Uh, maybe the, the offense was greater or they um, you know, were, were part of uh, um, something much more serious. Um, but essentially, it was also because these groups were part of um, prescribed organizations and the far-right offenders were not part of prescribed organizations. So, 
to get to your question, uh, once we released this research uh, in January, in February, two more groups were prescribed by the Home Office uh, Systems mm -hmm. System Resistance Network, which is part of National Action, which was already prescribed, and that followed after the murder of Joe Cox MP. And then um, Son and Craig Division, which I refer to as SKD, which people say is an, um, is an offshoot. Um, but I think it's, it's very interesting as to what, what prescription could lead to. Firstly, people take it more seriously because that's 10 years in prison versus a hate crime, which is a much shorter sentence and is seen as not nearly as bad as being part of a terrorist organization. Sorry, um, I think I lost you. Um, it's not seen as bad as being part of a terrorist organization, but also things like the use of symbols and imagery. Now, because these groups are prescribed, if you're online and you have a flag or you're pertaining to the group or even talking about it, you could get time in prison, which wouldn't have happened before. Um, you know, hate crimes are unpleasant. They often lead to violence, but big things become far more serious when it's a prescribed terrorist group. Um, so in that way, that has been quite effective. But as we see with Islamist groups uh, in this space, it has led to different things, splinters, new leaders, new names, uh, new ways of operating on these platforms. But still, I think it's a good step in the right direction that we did take this seriously and prescribe two new groups in February this year. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Really helpful, Nikita. Thank you. I think, you know, it sounds like the United Kingdom has taken steps in the right direction and even assessing, you know, the, the seriousness of the sentencing here, you know, looking at Islamist terrorist groups or terrorist offenders versus far right, you're seeing the far right get less serious charges um, uh, filed against them. So I think that's quite interesting. I want to pick up on one thing that that you mentioned, which is the um, the Son and Craig division that was prescribed in the UK, which is considered an offshoot of Adam Waffen. So I kind of want to go back to what Jason mentioned about the three requirements, right? We're talking uh, a group that needs to be foreign based, a group that needs to be engaging in terrorist activity in some way, and needs to be a threat to US national security. So I, I, I want to go into um, back to a little bit about what Jason mentioned on the difficulties, because there does seem to be a transnational link there. Um, and But we know that there are challenges with respect to the domestic terrorism piece. So Jason, can I pivot to you to talk a little bit about, about that, that, that transnational linkage, but also the fact that the US, as you mentioned, doesn't have a strong domestic terrorism law that carries serious criminal penalties? Sure. Um, so in terms of the the, the first question, the international linkages. Uh, as the State Department evaluates whether or not Atom Waffen Division has linkage to, say, SKD, as Nikita mentioned, or some other organization that's based overseas, like um, the Atom Waffen Division um, Gazian movement, which is the Ukrainian movement, um, the, the State Department may be looking at that open source information that we are seeing as researchers that lives online, whether it's on the open net or, you know, we've been able to, to parse information through Telegram and encrypted chats. Mm -hmm. um, they, they, they are seeing that, right? But they also likely have, um, and I know firsthand, um, lawyers who are saying, can you corroborate this information through other sources? And ideally, a dossier that leads to the designation signed off on by the Secretary of State has a, a mixture of unclassified information plus classified information. And my first point, I, I think, one of my early points was, my assessment is, um, I, I don't think there is a, a, a lack of interest within, say, the Counterterrorism Bureau or the Treasury Department's o OFAC to sanction these groups. I think they probably are missing the intelligence that they need to be able to corroborate what they're seeing in the um, open world. Um, unlike most of the countries that actually carry out prescriptions or designations, whatever you want to call it, um, some countries do it explicitly through unclassified information and put the entire dossier um, on their website like New Zealand does. The State Department doesn't do it like that. They, they have to use this classified information as well because everything the State Department does or Treasury Department does could end up in court. So they want to have that ironclad case, um, which speaks to the, the, the second point, I guess. Um, how can you get to that level where um, I think the State Department needs to be in terms of being able to go after those transnational networks? Again, I think it's intelligence collection, but I also think the, the law needs to be reviewed. The last time the Immigration Nationality Act was revised, uh, which is the underlying law that allows the State Department to sanction foreign terrorist organizations or FTOs, um, 
ICE in 2004. That's, you know, what, 16 years ago, right? Um, I'm not a math major. <laughs> so uh, um, I, I, it's old. Um, it needs to be updated and it needs to be more specific, I think, in the context of how the threat has evolved, where you have international networks that may have linkages that are perhaps more stark going to domestic organizations. So I, I think it's incumbent on Congress to, to revise that law. Um, at the same time, I think they need to revise the and think about a domestic terrorism law. I've written about this before for Lawfare um, twice already, once with a, a co-writer by the name of Mary McCord, he used to be in DOJ. And I really do think that um, there are some limitations in what DOJ and the FBI can do vis-a-vis -vis charges of individuals. You know, they're able to get them on charges related to murder, um, you know, swatting like they arrest John Cameron Denton, um, the Texas cell leader of the Atomwaffen Division. These lower level charges, kind of like the sort of the Al Capone model, you may not be able to get them on murder, but you can get them on tax evasion, right? Mm -hmm. There is no domestic terrorism statute that will allow for them to essentially say, um, we can go after these individuals for these lower tier crimes. Now, if a person uses a weapon of mass destruction, um, or explosives, then there may be a domestic terrorism charge. But short of that, it's going to be really difficult. And I think for that reason alone, um, providing DOJ and the FBI more flexibility in pursuing lower level charges to be able to label individuals like um, John Cameron Denton or Brandon Clint Russell as terrorists would be helpful. Um, but again, that's going to require an act of Congress. Um, for, for those reasons, I think um, it may be difficult um, in this political climate, sadly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, really helpful, Jason. Thank you. I think, you know, from the intelligence collection to the challenges on the domestic terrorism law, there's a lot, there's a lot there that stands in the way of, of potentially sanctioning a group like Adam Waffen. Um, and, the, and the steps that need to be taken are seem pretty significant. Um, I'm going to go back to Tess. Um, I'd be interested to hear your views on, you know, the utility of sanctions. Um, one thing, and, and you're, you, you've been a journalist covering this for a long time, What's your take on, you know, whether it's, you know, the threat of sanctions, the actual um, imposing of sanctions, uh, do you think that, that it makes a difference? Um, I think the threat of sanctions is definitely something that people talk about and, and, and almost anticipate that one day it's going to come. But I also think that sanctions alone aren't necessarily, um, that can't like, be the only way to dismantle white supremacist groups. Um, one thing that we, when Jason mentioned a soldier in Kansas, for example, Jarrett Smith, who, um, who was arrested for, you know, talking about wanting to blow up a news network. And for decades, white supremacists have, 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 have you know, sought to recruit current, um, you know, uh, military or, or ex-military. And that's especially true for right now for these kind of groups like Atom Waffen. And I think the Pentagon needs to have a, be more proactive in terms of addressing these problems within its ranks and weeding out um, radicalization. And then, you know, the other piece obviously is, is you know, work that like what Nikita does, like um, de-radicalization and education. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you for that. I'm gonna pose one final question before I turn it over to the 16 questions awaiting me in the Q&A box. So, you know, stepping a little bit away from Adam Waffen, um, and understanding the, the criteria, both from the UK perspective and the US perspective, I'd be interested to know, um, and, and we can start with Nikita and then maybe go to, to Jason, what other groups should we be looking at here um, in the broader white supremacy extremist movement to, to consider for sanctions? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll answer that um, quite generally because the groups that we've kind of pushed to prescribe in the UK have been prescribed but I think um, it gets back to this theoretical argument of you know what is prescription for um, it addresses a threat it, it ensures that punishment is actually matching the threat um, it allows police and law enforcement a new toolkit um, uh, to examine uh, some of these groups and at least in the United Kingdom what we've seen uh, is that this is a is a growing threat. Um, we have the unique ability to uh, have statistics based on people. I, it's controversial, but identifying a threat prior to it happening. Uh, these preventative statistics that we see the threat is almost as as big as 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 Islamist groups. Um, so uh, I, I, the prescription is is useful for that sense, but 
also, as we've certainly seen in history through Islamist groups, where there's a will, there's a way. So where people want to commit acts of violence, uh, they will find places to meet and speak, uh, where um, you know, they'll find new forums, they'll find new names, they'll find new figureheads. Um, and, and so really we have to kind of get down to the grassroots and understand why does people want to commit these acts of violence in the first place. Um, and through education and training and mentorship, kind of um, ensure that 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 will uh, no longer exists. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Akita. Jason, did you want to add to that? Sure. If if I were the uh, intelligence community, the State Department, Treasury Department, I would look at the the Son and Craig division, um, and I would coordinate with the British to see what they had in their dossier, because the British will use for their prescriptions a mix of unclassified and classified material. Um, and, and maybe they have something that the, the State Department could use in the context of pursuing a designation against Sonic Craig. And that's a fairly new designation, like Nikita mentioned. Um, you know, national action has been designated by the UK and then all its various name changes, which groups are really good about doing, whether you're talking about Islamist groups um, like Jabhat al-Nusra constantly changed its name to try to evade sanctions. Um, the Lashkar Taiba has done the same. So these groups will change names, trying to keep up with national action in the various names, maybe uh, working with the British to receive more information that provided the underlying basis for the Brits to, to sanction um, that organization and all its aliases would be helpful. And then, um, Emerita, you mentioned the uh, uh, Fear Craig Division. Um, I apologize for my German. Um, Fire and War Division within Germany. It's an organization that has actually communicated with um, alleged um, Atomwaffen Division members. Um, there was a white supremacist by the name of Connor Climo, who just pled guilty about a month and a half ago. Um, he was in contact with um, an individual within Fire Craig over gaming chat platforms based in Estonia, right? So here you have a connection between Atomwaffen Division and Fire Craig Division that I think is notable. I probably would start there, then I would look at the Ukrainian groups, groups like the Azov Battalion, um, um, Combat or C-14, um, which is also based in, in the Ukraine as well, and, and look at those organizations because they've been on the battlefield. Um, and they also have links to groups like the Atomwaffen Division. I saw some questions there. Um, the, uh, the head of Atomwaffen Division, for instance, in, in Washington State, um, um, was very eager to travel to, to Ukraine and to partner up with the Azov Battalion as just one example of a linkage between the U.S.-based Atomwaffen Division and the overseas Azov Ukrainian um, division that exists there as well. So that's where I would start. Great. Thank, thanks, Jason, for that. And you touched on uh, some of the questions, which is amazing. So we're going to pivot now to our question and answer period. And just so everyone knows, we will go on to 11.15. So we have time, time for questions. Um, first one, first question comes from Kurt Braggs. With respect to achieving the sanctions upon on on the Atomwaffen division, as as discussed today, are the challenges in the United States more a matter of logistics and bureaucracy, or do the barriers seem to be more political? So I will turn uh, first to Jason, and then I'll, I'll I'll go to Tess if you have anything anything to add on that. So I, I, initially, if you asked me this a year ago, my answer would be political. Um, today, over the last year, given what the FBI has been doing, um, DHS elevating the, the threat from white supremacy, um, you see this movement in the United States to take this issue far more seriously than, than you had a year ago. So now I think the issue is more um, bureaucratic, logistical. Um, and again, I just would reiterate um, information based. Um, so. You know, l let's just say I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it is a national intelligence party framework tier one or tier two target. Um, I, I don't think that's the case, um, but let's say it is. It's going to take a while to develop the networks um, to collect the information to essentially find out who these individuals are. Um, it takes a while to develop human intelligence sources on the ground to develop those networks and gain trust from individuals who may be based overseas. Uh -huh. And then it takes a while to collect the right selector information, the phone numbers, the email addresses, um, and, and then essentially taking that and then putting it into the system and then collecting the information that could be used for a possible designation. So there could be a, a situation where you have a lag time, where maybe there is intelligence collection, I'm completely wrong, um, but you know they're developing the, the mechanisms to collect that information. Um, mm -hmm. Or I might be right and they're not collecting it because um, it's not a priority. So I, I think um, it's those those things that are the primary challenge for the State Department right now or the Treasury Department. And for the Treasury Department, I'll just say Treasury Department has what we call derivative authorities. Essentially, they have to 
piggyback on an already existing designation of an organization before they can use their executive order powers. So for them, they may be able to go after the Russian imperial movement, go after facilitators within that network of the Russian imperial movement, only because the State Department designated RIM. No other white supremacist group is designated by the State Department, so therefore it's going to be harder for Treasury to use its tool. So I just want to throw that out there as well for folks' consideration. Thanks for that, Jason. Tess, anything to add there? Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I can't speak to the administrative barriers, maybe, but I guess some of the challenges, which goes back to your question, actually, about the efficacy of um, sanctions, which is, I mean, the, you know, the white supremacists who've carried out acts of violence, like in, in Pittsburgh, El Paso, Poe, Christchurch, none of them belong to a group. You know, they were radicalized online and were part of these online communities. But I think part of the challenge is, you know, whether going after these groups is really going to prevent those kinds of acts in the future, people who are just absorbing this propaganda, um, which is not linked to a particular group. Mm -hmm. Very helpful. Um, so I'm going to pose the next question. Uh, this is coming from Abdul Basit, Research Fellow, RSIS, coming from Singapore. Uh, have you seen any organizational learning between the Islamist extremists and the far right in the West? Are the two engaged in reciprocal radicalization and copying each other's tactics for recruitment, propaganda dissemination, and violent activities? I, I think you all can answer this one, but I'm gonna turn uh, first to Nikita. Yeah, that's, um, uh, that's a very interesting question. And, and reciprocal radicalization was something that a lot of people were studying, say in 2017. Um, and in, in my own work, I don't like to make any kind of um, sweeping generalizations because you don't know whether things are causative or just happen to be a coincidence. But certain areas do overlap. Um, and now I mean not one causing the other, but what two very different groups would have in common. Uh, when we see um, rhetoric online about refugee sentiment, uh, there's a very strong anti-refugee sentiment with the far right. And uh, with, with Islamism, we were, all, we were also seeing some videos about people leaving the Islamic State or leaving Syria and then deserving to die because they were leaving the, you know, that land. Um, but in terms of more strategy as well in, in online videos, kind of takes me back to what I was saying in, 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 in previously, which is there's some learning going on. So, um, you know, Islamist groups, uh, ISIS, for example, were very good at long videos, documentary style videos, um, use of conspiracy theories. We see some of that being used by the far right as well. Um, but, you know, the scale is different um, and the scale, at least in the UK, there's less of um, a very tight network. And that's because in the United Kingdom for a long time, we had, we still do have groups like Al Muhajirun, which set a lot of the mood music for people to then go and travel. Um, so I wouldn't say that it's reciprocal in that sense. And I think another key difference as well, beyond these kind of international networks is the travel. Um, because a lot of British people, uh, 900 in fact, were, were leaving, left the country to join um, Islamic State. And uh, in the far right, this tends to happen within their own homes or you know, they, they have the sense of nationhood, uh, which, is, which is different. They don't necessarily want to leave their countries. Um, it also makes it more difficult to pick up extremism because you have a sense of patriotism and where does that then go too far into becoming, uh, you know, white extreme, white supremacism. So there are unique challenges in this space and I don't think that sexy as it might be to kind of link the two directly. I don't think that that's the case, at least in my experience, um, studying the, the two separate groups. Thanks. Yeah, I also to to Jason, if you had anything to add to that. So I, I think Nikita did a really great job mm -hmm. um, in the nail on the head on, on that question. The only thing I would, would add that I think is just interesting um, is that you've had white supremacist groups um, and Ottomwaffen divisions done this point to, to bin Laden somehow in, in admiration of bin Laden's attacks against the United States in the context of 9-11. Um, you have individuals, uh, you know, Matthew Heinbach, part of the traditional West Workers Party, who, who now says he's reformed and no longer part of the movement. Um, whether you believe him or not, that's another question, right? But he was, you know, posing in, in front of, um, you know, flags that, or wearing Hezbollah t-shirts and like, things like that, where I, I think 
the idea of crippling the, the enemy of the, the state, the, the quote unquote West um, in, in all its decadence is, is a narrative these organizations share. They may share a narrative in the same target, but in terms of cooperation with one another and feeding off each other, I, I, think, I, I take Nikita's point that, you know, this, this is, that would be overstatement. Um, and they may use the same kinds of platforms to communicate, right? Um, and they may learn from essentially the, the videos that um, Jihadi John put forward um, you know, when the decapitation of um, Western hostages were, were held and then Adam Waffen will, you know, carry out a video um, with a person wielding a knife and burning flags to try to essentially play on the imagery um, but beyond that, in terms of cooperation, I, I think I agree with Nikita that that doesn't really exist, that they, they, may, they may not be necessarily like doing this in, in tandem or cooperation. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. Um, next question uh, related to news and media it comes from Valentina Bianco from Achea. Uh, do you think that newspapers and media in general are doing a fair job in condemning white supremacy groups in the same way they have done with Islamic groups in the past. Is there any institutional implicit bias that somehow treats white supremacy extremism in a less rigorous way? So I'll point that one to Tess. It's a great question. Um, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, I think that there's been a, like, a serious learning curve since Charlottesville about how to talk about the new um, white supremacist extremist threat in this particular iteration. Um, and I think there have been, you know, and I've not already always gotten it right. I think there has been, um, people have kind of accidentally given them a platform. For example, embedding a video um, that's from Atom Waffen when they wouldn't have done the same with an ISIS video. You know, you're still, you're still promoting their propaganda. So I think in terms of like, you know, making sure that you're not giving the platform to their ideas, but you're also exposing it without amplifying it, it's been a whole balance. And I think it's just, you know, been a learning curve. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that one. I'm going to uh, pose this next question. This comes from Madison Connolly. Uh, and, and this touches on a couple of themes that other people have, have posed in the chat in the, in the question and answer. For all panelists, would you be able to expand on Adam Waffen's success or failure in establishing international links? Was the group's efforts organized in any strategic sense or more based on the personalities of the individuals involved. Um, and I'll note that this question underneath a sub question or other questions have, uh, individuals have asked about Adam Waffen's connections to Nordic countries, as well as Ukraine and, and Azov Battalion. So uh, it's, a, it's one question of, of, of many I've seen in the chat. So I'm gonna start with Jason for that one and then we can move around for others to add. That's a, that's a great question. Um, the, my answer is I, I'm still not sure of the organization's legacy or impact um, for, for a couple of reasons. Um, one reason is I'm not sure I believe um, James Mason when he made his statement on March 20th that the organization is truly defunct. Um, if it is defunct, then it's an organization that lasted just a little bit over five years. And if that was truly the, the, the life of the organization, then it was a, an abysmal failure. Um, you know, was it an organization that was able to like, have some kind of links um, with overseas organizations? Yes, um, they cultivated that. They were interested in it. You can go to Iron March and you can see um, leadership figures within the organization communicating with the Azov Battalion. Um, so I, I think in that sense, they were able to establish those networks. Um, but I don't think that makes them very different from other um, far right um, radical white supremacist organizations. Um, they, they are communicating with one another, um, and sometimes they meet together in places like Charlottesville. Is, is that something that we can point to as a success of the Otham Waffen division? I think the answer is probably not. I think it's more of a success, unfortunately, for the wider movement, the white supremacist and radical right movement in general. And the reason why that has been success, why these linkages do exist now, is because of the ubiquity of the internet and these communication tools. And, and that's not something the Atham Waffen Division can point to as uh, something that they created. It's something they leveraged. Um, and the broader community is leveraging and has been leveraging for, for quite some time. So I, I know that may not be a satisfactory answer for, for the, the person who asked the question, but, but that's my perspective for what it's worth. 
Thanks, Jason. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to blitz through a couple of questions now because I, I think we're getting a couple more. Um, but this, this one comes from Chris Costa in DC. Um, and, and this is an interesting one. How does incel ideology factor into Adam Waffen's thinking and actions and or a nexus? Uh, between that. So um, the incel movement, it's one that um, I, I personally have not seen a ton of, of coverage on, um, but I think merits a, a, a focus. So I, I, I will start, I don't know if Tess, I know you've covered a bit of perhaps not incel, but the role um, I, I want to say women have played a bit in, into some of these movements. So Tess, I'll, I'll pivot that one to you and then maybe if others have, have to add. Well, I will say, so the, the, the training manual, you know, the nine page document, um, you know, they, they do have requirements for who can, you know, say that they're Adam Waffen and there's nothing in there about being, you know, you have to be white, nothing um, from what I can tell that you think you have to be male. And in fact, one of the people who were arrested during this kind of, um, a, a whole um, slew of arrests related to harassing um, journalists and activists of, of Adam Waffen members, um, one was a woman, un unclear if she was actually a member of Atom Waffen, but she was definitely swept up within this group. So I thought that was really interesting. It was the first time I'd heard of a woman being affiliated um, or even linked to Adam Waffen. And obviously incels, it's a very, it's a, it's a male oriented ideology. Um, I have not seen a ton of overlap, but um, there is definitely overlap between incels and the broader white supremacist um, movement. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jason or Nikita, anything to add to that? Jason? I, I definitely would say the ideology of the organization is, is not one that um, necessarily shares an affinity with the larger incel movement. So I, I agree with Tess on that. The only thing I would point out is that the Atomwaffen division in Ukraine um, had distributed posters online that listed their requirements for the Ukrainian division. And that included being, quote, a, a white male um, within the organization. So, so there, at least that organization says, um, at least if you believe their posters that were distributed, um, that, that there is this white maleness associated with being part of that organization. Um, white supremacist groups more generally um, will have women within their networks. Um, so I think it also makes them different from the incel movement. Now, how the women are treated within those networks will vary from group to group. There are some organizations historically that see women as nurturers, um, not as individuals who are operational per se. Um, and, and in that sense, maybe they're not so different from some of the older you know, Islamist organizations you know, from the 1980s and 90s before those organizations shifted their own perspective. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thanks for that. Uh, Nikita, I don't know if you had anything to add. So, there was a, a few days ago a very interesting report out by um, Moonshot CVE. It's an um, organization here in the UK that looked at um, incel communities. And I'm not an expert on um, incels at all. But, you know, when we look at extremism, you look at this idea that uh, people want to do violence to certain groups. And I'm sure that there is overlap uh, in terms of misogyny and general hatred for women. Um, and uh, I absolutely agree with Tess and Jason that when there is involvement of women in groups, doesn't necessarily mean that those uh, women will be treated as equals. We certainly saw that with Islamic State, very um, strong rule books about what women were allowed to do and never to commit acts of violence unless their homes were being attacked. And fighters, they were more nurturers, and so kind of takes you to this idea that um, there's certain gender stereotypes, but uh, haven't seen any kind of overlap in that way um, yet. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Nikita. Uh, next question comes from Bruce Hoffman. I wonder if the speakers could address the role that the emulation of Charles Manson plays in the Adam Waffen division's ideology and also of Satanism. For instance, if there's any overlap with communities such as 09A, Order of the Nine Angels, and other such Satanist worship oriented groups. Uh, so I think I will, maybe I'll go first to, to Tess if you have anything on that, and then to Jason. Sure. Um, great question. Actually, Satanism was sort of one of the major issues that um, Atom Wolfman was dealing with internally um, a few years ago. Because I mean, the group has quite an apocalyptic worldview and that sort of slides into Satanism. And, 
there was an internal rift and some people left because they just felt like it was getting too close to Satanism and they were, you know, religious or wanted to have some sort of like, uh, I don't know, it just, it wasn't really what they're about. So that was one of, that was actually was one of the issues. And I think there was some overlap with the groups that you, you referred to. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that test. Jason, anything to add? No, I, I actually you know, I had as one of my points of influencers, um, Charles Manson mentioned, um, I just neglected to, to mention him. I focused primarily on Pierce and Mason. So um, I, I think Tess is exactly right. Um, Manson early on in the days of Amwalk and division certainly was a figure that the organization and individuals within the organization may have pointed to. And I, I think eventually over time, they, they may have uh, slid away from that, that model. But the, the idea of, of anarchy, um, nihilism, um, you know, hatred for the state and for, for elites, um, I, I think generally it are things that they, as an organization, have glommed onto. So they're, they're in, in that sense, there is this, uh, I guess, still uh, loose affinity um, with, with Charles Manson, right? So I, I, I can't speak to the Order of the Nine Angels. Uh, I'm only recently tracking that, whether or not there's any kind of like linkage between the two organizations. From my perspective, I've not been able to, to assess that out yet. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to pivot now to, to, ta uh, excuse me, to, to Nikita for this question comes from Leela McClintock. Uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, do you anticipate a change in operations of these white supremacist extremist groups? And will the pandemic cause these groups to splinter differently? So I'll turn to Nikita first and then Tess if you have anything to add. Yeah, I'm sure um, Tess would be much better placed to speak on the specifics. Um, and I just wanted to pick up on, on a previous question, which I thought was a very interesting one. Um, are we doing the job of some of these groups for them? Uh, is the media doing the job of that? And it's absolutely, I agree, it's a learning curve. And in fact, we, we forget uh, how the media used to galvanize on these beheading videos and because it sold papers and it took a lot of, you know, government engagement to kind of bring them on board to, to not do that. Um, so I, I, that takes me to kind of answering this question is I think a lot of it is already online. I think it will be even more online. And, and my fear is, as well as the public health emergency we've seen where we are also now seeing an economic emergency, a huge recession, people will not have jobs. And that tends to be um, two areas where people seek out either extremist or terrorist groups. Uh, one, they need a sense of belonging and an explanation as to why the world has done this to them, um, a way to explain their grievance, for example. And secondly, um, if you, know, you don't have a sense of purpose or a job or an economic income, then uh, you can often turn to, to this to blame someone or hate someone for it. Um, so I think, uh, not to speak technically about splinters, but I think there is room there for um, growth uh, in, in some of these uh, white supremacist movements, and I think that growth will be happening uh, online um, as more people will be going to the online space to understand uh, the COVID pandemic. Thanks, Nikita. I'll turn to Tess to, to add to that. Yeah, I absolutely, yeah, spot on. I completely agree with what you're saying. I also think that these groups, they, they thrive on instability. And so the moment of political instability in the US um, has created this kind of window of opportunity. Um, and you've seen that with extremists of co-opting some of the anti-lockdown protests um, or, you know, anti-government extremists showing up with, you know, heavily armed um, or people, you know, carrying anti-Semitic signs. Um, so there's that. And then there's also um, some examples um, online of, um, of these kind of accelerationists wanting to, uh, I mean, they were talking about trying to get infected with COVID. 19 and then going into you know minority communities so, don't, so how they can sort of make it work for themselves and then also just exploiting the moment of crisis yeah no incredibly yeah very helpful um thank you tessa nikita so final question before we uh close out um this one is a finance question so i'm gonna i'm gonna pivot this one to to jason um and and i'm trying to to weave in a couple of other questions related um, can you discuss uh, how the Adam Lofton division finances its activities? And, and within that, does Adam Lofton or other groups uh, take advantage of the terror crime nexus? So is there any linkages between um, criminal groups and groups like the Adam Lofton division? 
So great question. Uh, and I'll try to address it broadly and as quickly as possible, because I know we're a little short on, on time. Um, so Automoffin Division um, used to sell um, t-shirts via an online portal called Inktail. They did it briefly. Um, white supremacist movements um, and organizations more generally have tried to monetize clothing for a very long time. The KKK sells belt buckles, um, pins, flags, um, paraphernalia in general, um, and they've been doing so for um, a very long time. Uh, Cynthia Idris um, has done some great work on the white supremacy movement and the selling of, of garb. And I think this is one way that these groups have tried to fund themselves. Um, they tried to raise money through cryptocurrency. If you look at the uh, Andrew Anglin and the Daily Stormer, they have made a lot of money by getting contributions from individuals who may be like-minded about uh, the quote unquote reporting of the Daily Stormer, um, making money through cryptocurrency. And the reason why a lot of these organizations have been deplatformed from payment processors um, like um, you know, e um, PayPal and things like uh, of that nature, credit card companies won't process their payments. So um, I think you've seen a, a shift of cryptocurrency. Um, Richard Spencer, um, and, you know, like sort of one of the, the preeminent um, individuals, quote unquote, thinkers within the alt right, has said that cryptocurrency is the currency and Bitcoin is the currency of the far right movement. Um, in terms of crime terror nexus, you know, you have organizations like the Aryan Brotherhood, for instance, um, prison gangs. Um, move drugs um, and have financed themselves like that. Um, they're white supremacist criminal organizations. And then sort of in the 1980s, you have groups like The Order carrying out a, a rash of, of bank robberies. So um, uh, this is all, all to say that organizations have used a, a mix of licit and illicit um, sources of financing to, to, to make money. Um, the John Cameron Denton, um, who was arrested for a swatting incident um, in 2020, I think this year, uh, maybe about a, a month ago, had, had written on, I think it was Discord, the need for the organization to pool their finances. So he also had to think about it through the lens of microfinance as well. He said, let's take all the money we have earned, um, presuming that they have jobs, um, and let's take our money and carve out a new space for us in the Pacific Northwest um, where we can have our own compound. So, also, it's going to be funding through their own sources, um, through their own jobs. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, so we're running uh, out of time. I'm going to keep my closing remarks very brief. I think we've discussed many different themes here. And uh, I want to ask our panelists in one minute or less if they can uh, share with us what their call to action is moving forward, uh, both on Adam Waffen and on the broader white supremacist movement as we think about you know, what actions governments, multinational institutions, civil society organizations, news organizations should be taking. So I will, I will turn to Tess first, then we'll move to Nikita and Jason. Um, I think that a lot of it comes from trying to understand the root causes of, of you know, why, what makes someone vulnerable to, um, to getting radicalized. And this has been a lot of the work that Nikita probably does. Um, um, just understanding that, I mean, most people don't wake up and become a Nazi overnight. You know, there's a process and finding out what, you know, what's the trigger and, and where you can intervene and, and, and stop it. Thanks, Tess. Nikita? Yeah, I, I would echo that. I think um, sanctions and prescription are a top-down approach, and they're definitely necessary for the seriousness of the crime, but we also need a bottom-up approach, and that will involve uh, engaging with people you know, prevention is easier than cure. Once you put someone in prison, things become more difficult in terms of de-radicalizing them. So trying to prevent these ideas from escalating into violence or having appeal. And that's where the UK has a great program when it comes to mentorship and reformers as well. People who have exited these groups who can speak, uh, for want of a better phrase, speak the same language, appeal to the same ideas and say, actually, have you thought about a different worldview? Um, and it's, you know, we, we see on the news, I'll say this quickly, but we see on the news all the time, the bad things that happen. That's the nature of terrorism. We see the attacks, we see the problem, but what the news doesn't cover is all those good cases, the people we prevented from having these uh, um, violent issues or uh, the people that we've reformed and that doesn't make the headlines. So there is a lot of positivity in this as well. And I think we have to focus on that to keep going and, and to meet the problem. Thanks, Nikita. What, very well said. Uh, Jason, next and, and final final word before we close. Yeah, um, it's hard for me to do anything in less than a, a minute, but I'll, I'll 
I can, um, and there goes five seconds. So uh, I think it's really uh, goes to the one question on, on COVID-19. I, I think we are certainly at an inflection point with some of these organizations who want to leverage the COVID-19 um, crisis um, for their own accelerations theories. Um, and I think it's important to maybe try to think about the scope of this threat in, in the context of a Venn diagram. You have disinformation, something that the white supremacy community is really good at. Um, you have conspiracy theories, and then you have this, this nexus between um, the accelerationists. And I think understanding that, that Venn diagram, this, this nexus of disinformation um, in the context of COVID-19 and conspiracy theory and acceleration theory is really important to, to get a grasp on. And that requires good information. So my plea is try to collect more information as researchers, um, academics, um, reporters on this threat, and then those within the intelligence community um, try to report to the policymakers the scope of the threat. Um, particularly through the lens of what's happening right now in the context of COVID-19. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jason. And, and thank you, everyone, to, to all of our panelists today. It was a superb, fascinating uh, discussion and much, much to do uh, and much to follow up on. So I want to thank you to our panelists. Thank you to everyone who has joined us uh, today. Uh, this won't be the last conversation, I assure you, on Adam Waffen or on the broader white supremacist movement. Uh, the Supan Center, we've been covering this for quite a long time, and we will continue to cover this, as well as some of the threads uh, that were mentioned here, from disinformation to the anatomy of, of these groups. So, so again, thank you so very much, uh, and we'll, we'll keep you informed on, on the next webinar. Thank you. Take care. <laughs>